Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I also look forward to being taught, as always, by Elder Condi. And to be honest, I look forward to eating the nice little treats in the basket provided by Brother Top. So thank you, Jennifer, Elder Condi, and Brother Top. <laughs> May I begin this evening by saying Happy Easter. That might be an odd way to start out, but uh, it's especially odd for me. You see, I'm the type of person that believes that holidays and birthdays and events should actually be celebrated on the birthday, at the event, or in the season. I'm the person that doesn't listen to Christmas music until long after Thanksgiving. Yes, I'm that guy. And so I'm going to say it again, and I'm not going to be embarrassed. As unusual as this might be for me, Happy Easter. It is my hope and prayer that we might have Easter more often than not. That it's not just a single Sunday that we celebrate the Easter season, but it could be every Sunday that we celebrate that. So I think that that's an important way to begin, especially on a conference discussing such a wonderful time. Elder Richard G. Scott reminded us that Easter brings thoughts of Jesus, his life, his atonement, his resurrection, his love. Now it's my plan to focus on the third element of Elder Scott's statement, and by doing so, I hope that we might better understand the Savior's love. Now, unfortunately, I fear that this is much easier said than actually done. You see, in 1966, Aubrey Singer, a producer for the British Broadcasting System, convinced or conceived an idea of bringing together creative individuals from 19 different nations to appear on a live global satellite television link. Now, Singer's dream became a reality on June 25th when the largest television audience at that time, estimated to be over 400 million people in 25 different countries, watched musicians, leaders, artists, and iconic images live via satellite. Perhaps the most memorable event of this broadcast turned out to be a musical number that was commissioned by the British Broadcasting Corporation. You see, they wanted a song with a message that everyone, regardless of race, culture, political orientation, geography, or even religiosity could easily understand. So they turned to John Lennon and Paul McCartney of the Beatles, who wrote a simple song with phrases like, all you need is love, and love is all you need, need repeated 51 times throughout the entire song. To underscore their simplicity and their approach of being as simple as possible, they composed a chorus that chants the word love nine times in succession, repeated twice throughout the song. Now, it would be difficult to create something more simple. In fact, Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager at the time, said, quote, the nice thing about it is that it cannot be misinterpreted, end of quote. Now, a recent response to a posting by a student on a popular website seeking help with his homework, however, may prove actually Mr. Epstein's comment and assessment to be somewhat faulty. The student posted, quote, I am doing my homework, and we have to write 10 reasons why love is so misunderstood, close quote. Among the many, many responses that this student received, one person wrote, quote, the main reason love is misunderstood is people misunderstand it, close quote. <laughs> Maybe I should just close right there. <laughs> well, really, there's nothing more astounding than the obvious. But it is true that this response will not move the needle on the meter for higher critical thinking. But it does demonstrate that love, even when it is presented in a very simple and even a repetitive way, is often still me easily misunderstood and often misinterpreted. Now, this really shouldn't be surprising. After all, the very language that we use to create clarity is dependent on our ability to accurately decipher words, understand context, and combine words and meanings appropriately. So the way you may define love may be very different from the way that I understand love. Some may turn to a dictionary to find clarity but only to find that the word love is actually defined in any one of the following. An intense feeling, a romantic feeling, sexual attraction, or even sexual behavior. So it is clear that we cannot take a word at face value, especially when it comes to the word love. 
Now, after saying that the Beatles' new song couldn't be misinterpreted, Mr. Epstein, their manager, went on to say that the song, quote, is a clear message saying that love is everything, close quote. Now, at face value, it is easy to embrace Mr. Epstein's assessment, for intuitively, it sounds right, it seems right, and actually, it feels right. You see, in 1969, and maybe we look at it in a different twist, however, just two years after All You Need in Love is Love it reached the top of the music chart, and during a time when anti-war slogans evoking the name of love were widely used, Elder Gordon B. Hinckley warned about those clamoring for, quote, love as the solution to all of the world's problems, close quote. He cautioned, their expression may sound genuine, but their coin is counterfeit. Elder Hinckley's comments are vital because he was pointing out that real love is often mistaken for some other feeling, action, or idea, a, a counterfeit, if you will, or an imitation or a forgery of the real thing. Elder Marvin J. Ashton described it in this way. He said, quote, too often expediency, infatuation, stimulation, persuasion, or even lust are mistaken for love, close quote. Elder Hinckley also said that the way the world views love, uh, views love and talks about love is, quote, at best only hollow mummery, close quote. Now, mummery has nothing to do with mummies. It means to mutter, to murmur, to act, or to mime. These are tools that are used to express something while purposefully holding back the full intent or the complete meaning. Elder Hinckley's insightful description then helps us to see that the love, uh, that love, as the world understands it then, is potentially dangerous because if we accept a diluted form of love or embrace a counterfeit in any way, shape, or form, then we forfeit the full understanding and full rewards predicated upon real love. The scriptures emphasize that love is about fullness. For example, John writes, quote, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full, close quote. Now, full, in this context, is used to translate the Greek word pleru, meaning replete or finished. In some interpretations, this word is described as a filler that rounds out our imperfections or dents. Or in other words, it makes something complete. It fills it in. This is important to understand for the love that we are speaking of here tonight is a full measure of love and the only means whereby our joy may be complete or made full. Now, Elder Hinckley taught that the full essence of love is like a polar star. He said, quote, In a changing world, love is a constant. It is the very essence of the gospel. It is the security of the home. It is the safeguard of community life. It is a beacon of hope in a world of distress. End of quote. Now, some of you may be thinking, quote, See, Gordon B. Hinckley, the Beatles, their manager, they were all right. Love is all that you need. But remember, though, that the love that Elder Hinckley is speaking of here may not be the same type of love or the love that others are thinking about. You see, when seeking true love, we must recognize that the night sky is actually filled with a myriad of unfixed stars, counterfeit polar stars, each fawning for our, our attention as if it were the sure and guiding light. But these counterfeits can provide some measure of illumination and some measure of guidance. But only the, nor the one star, the polar star, provides the constant answer for an ever-changing world. The scriptures tell us that the full essence of love suffereth long and is kind and envieth not and is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, so important is this authentic form of love that those who are not found possessing it 
in the last day are, as Moroni would say, nothing. For love, is it, love in its fullest sense is free from the world's delusions, from wickedness, and as Gordon B. Hinckley described, quote, savors of the sweet, all-encompassing love of Christ, close quote. No wonder Moroni called this love the pure love of Christ. Those who would like to learn about the pure love of Christ must be willing to encounter that his love might be something very different from what they are used to hearing or have come to expect. You see, if one approaches learning about the Savior's love with a casual, self-satisfied attitude, then only varying portions of the fullness of his love can be realized. Now, this is not to say that we are incapable of loving or that the love of the Savior is beyond our grasp, but merely to say that truly understanding the love of the Savior is untainted by humankind's ways. The teachings that help us understand Christ's love are not wrought with distractions or pomp or um, a circumstance of their own. And therein actually lies the danger. With such a clean and simple approach to love, even the saints are tempted to spruce it up a bit, to add our own agendas, to become satisfied with status quo, or simply allow the views of the world to define our understanding of real love. But when properly understood, however, the pure love of the Savior provides direction for all of mankind. The scriptures connect the fullness of love not with casual emotions, affection, or even passion, but with God. For example, John wrote, For love is of God. And to ensure that he was not misunderstood, John emphasized yet another time, God is love. This means that if one desires true and pure love, one must desire God. Herein is love the scriptures teach. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Although love is intended to be a reciprocal relationship, we must first understand that the pure love of God is not contingent upon our love for him, for love begins with God and not with us. John explained that, quote, we love him because he first loved us, close quote. So rather than considering these statements as a reason for us to love God, however, we can see that John's point is that love begins with God. And his love is what allows us to love. Let me say that again. It's what allows us to love. Not only him, but everything. Because the love of God is the genesis of our ability to truly love, we need to understand that if we remove God from love for any reason, then we forfeit the ability to practice love in its fullest sense. So how we embrace the world, whether with unabashed acceptance or with flirtatious encounters with all of its subtleties, actually creates boundaries between God and us. James, the author of the epistle of James, wrote, quote, Whosoever there will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, close quote. So when we entertain that which removes God from our lives, it is not his love for us that decreases, but the presence of his spirit that diminishes. C.S. Lewis emphasized, quote, the great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. It is not wearied by our sins our, and, or our indifference, close quote. Although God still loves us, our understanding and ability to true love is forfeited because of our loss of the Spirit with us. You see, where God is not, love in its fullness cannot be. With the inseparable connection between love and God firmly established, we can now turn our focus to what the love of God is and how it is manifest. The scriptures tell us, quote, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him, end of quote. You see, according to John, the love of God is made known, through Jesus Christ, 
including those wondrous Easter events. This means that Christ, being commissioned of the Father, is the manifestation of the fullness of God's love to all mankind. So how might, how might we fully embrace the pure love of God and Jesus Christ? Well, the scriptures remind us that, quote, love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God, close quote. So in order to receive and exercise God's full love, we must be born of God. The prophet Moroni pleaded with those who would hear his message to, quote, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart, that ye may be filled with this love, which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God. End of quote. Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated that the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, quote, take upon them his name in the waters of baptism and certify anew each time, each time they partake of the sacrament, that they have so done. Or, more accurately, in the waters of baptism, power is given them to become the sons of Christ, which eventuates when they are, in fact, born of the Spirit and become new creatures of the Holy Ghost, end of quote. We can receive the fullness of God's love only by entering into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. So by maintaining our covenantial status, when we are, or we are born of Christ, and thus we become the sons and the daughters of Christ. Whether, this, whether the discussion is about becoming reborn or becoming children of Christ, Christ will always be at the center of these discussions. You see, as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, we have covenanted to keep his commandments. Jesus taught, quote, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Close quote. Now this means and implies that we will keep his commandments because we love Jesus Christ. But Jesus also taught that, quote, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. End of quote. You see, when we keep the commandments, we find that Jesus Christ manifests himself, or in other words, makes himself known to us. This simple concept presents an interesting situation. Many of those who keep the commandments do so because they already love Jesus Christ. They, according to prophetic blessing, will have a manifestation of Christ. He will make himself known to them. But consider these verses applied in other circumstances. So what of those who have not yet come to love Christ? Are they to obey uh, Christ's or God's commandments and be obedient as well? C.S. Lewis felt that some people worry because they are unsure if they love God. And so when those people don't know if they should keep the commandments because they're not sure if they love God, he said concerning these individuals, quote, they are told they ought to love God. They cannot find any such feelings in themselves. What are they to do? Act as if you did. Do not sit trying to manufacture feelings. Ask yourself, if I were sure that I loved God, what would I do? When you have found the answer, go and do it. Lewis further observed, As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. End of quote. No wonder Jesus Christ taught that if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Not only will the obedient know the divine source of the doctrine, but they will grow in love toward the master as well. This, thus the cycle of love and obedience begins anew, ever deepening with each act of obedience and receipt of divine manifestation. Our obedience maintains our covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, which facilitates the manifestation of God's love. 
We can fill the fullness of the Father only when our covenants with Christ are in effect. And we become more proficient in our maintaining our covenant by taking his name upon us and keeping his commandments. And And then, not only do we draw closer to the Savior, but he becomes a constant fixture in our lives to be with us always. Christ taught, quote, If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. End of quote. Now, with all of this in mind, you can sense, I hope we can sense, the importance of the sacrament being instituted in relationship with the atonement and the, res- and the resurrection. It is because of this covenant ordinance that makes receiving the love of God and loving others possible in its fullness. The sacrament is a weekly reminder of Easter. Disciples of Jesus Christ are reminded that mere mere familiarity with the Savior's message is simply not sufficient to obtain the full love of God. My little children, John counseled, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. President Howard W. Hunter taught, quote, merely saying, accepting, believing are not enough. They are incomplete until that which they imply is translated into the dynamic action of daily living, close quote. Loving others is regarded as the badge of Christianity. After all, Christ taught, By their fruits ye shall know them. But he also taught, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. But his commandment was not merely to learn to love others, but to love one another as he has loved you, that ye also will thereby love one another. So as we consider the depth of the love that is God's to give, it is really quite amazing to think that it has been made available to us. The scriptures teach that we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and that the love of God is manifest toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. It is true that Easter focuses primarily on the atonement and the resurrection. But we must never forget, as this scripture points out so well, that the atonement and the resurrection are the fruits born of pure love. Such love is fitting to be at the center of an Easter celebration. And while some may debate the origin of the name Easter, I can't help but consider the possible connection with the German Oster, or I like to say Oster in Danish, meaning, same thing as in German, East, or even perhaps more importantly, symbolizing the rising of the sun. This is also connected with the old Teutonic form, meaning, quote, first to stand or resurrection, close quote. I really like this connection because for me, Easter is a time of rebirth. It is the light of a new day, of a new life. It is a time of standing after being knocked down. In other words, it is a commemoration of events that change us, that make us new. Paul taught that if any man live in Christ, he is a new creature, and old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You see, the Savior's mission and sacrifice, his Easter mission, if you will, in some miraculous way, changes not only how we love and act, but also who we are. The atonement in some way, wrote Elder Bruce C. Hafen, apparently through the Holy Ghost, makes possible the infusion of spiritual endowments that actually change and purify our nature moving us toward that state of holiness or completedness we call eternal life or godlike life. At that ultimate stage, we will exhibit divine characteristics, not just because we think we should, 
but because that is the way we are. End of quote. Jesus Christ, the love of God, provides hope for salvation. No wonder John exults, quote, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made of perfect, or is not made perfect in love, close quote. Thank goodness for Easter, a time to push away fear and to be filled with pure love. So when the scriptures ask what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, it is clear that the answer is of love, but not a counterfeit love, nor a portion of love, but a fullness of love thereof. This is a full measure of pure, lo of, of pure love that is founded in God. It is from God that all love springs forth. We learn that Jesus Christ is in reality the love of God. And thus we can fill the fullness of God's love as we enter into a covenant and become born of Christ. We reciprocate the Savior's love by keeping the commandments and by loving others. It is because of the ultimate sacrifice, the fulfilling of the mission of Christ, that we are able to become new creatures and thereby love others as Christ loved us. This is the only way to find the love that will guide and direct our lives for peace, dispose of fear, and bring us to a fullness of joy, to be filled with the pure love, even Jesus Christ. Thus, to a world that clamors for love as the solution to all of the world's problems and sings that love in any form is all that we need, here are the lyrics to yet one more song then to consider. I feel my Savior's love in all the world around me. His Spirit warms my soul through everything I see. I feel my Savior's love. Its gentleness enfolds me. And when I kneel to pray, my heart is filled with peace. I feel my Savior's love and know that he will bless me. I offer him my heart, my shepherd he will be. I'll share my Savior's love by serving others freely. In serving, I am blessed. In giving, I receive. He knows I will follow him, give all my life to him. I feel my Savior's love, the love he freely gives me. Keeping all of this in mind, I believe that we can accurately and say with confidence and assurance that all we need is love, the Savior's love. It is my earnest hope and sincere prayer that this is the love we all feel this Easter, and always in his sacred name, Jesus Christ. Amen.